computer is warming up. <clears throat> Just some preliminary remarks about um, our scripture reading. As you know, if you've read the book of Revelation, it's full of s symbols, and uh, we can't take them all literally. Um, for example, the issue of they, they um, didn't defile themselves with women. While it's a good practice to be faithful to your spouse, it's not what it's talking about. It's that women represent um, the church, and there's a harlot, and there's a, there's a pure woman. So anyway, that's just um, an illustration. But excuse me while I get to my... I find it easier, if you don't mind, to... Um, to use this as bigger print. This is supposed to turn to a, there we go. Okay. Well, on May 2, uh, for those of you who connected on the internet, uh, you may remember that we started a series uh, on the, focusing on the Lamb of God. The title of the first message was Behold the Lamb. The title of the second was The Bleeding Lamb. And the title of today's message is Follow the Lamb. Well, I don't know if you have a favorite story in the Bible. Um, over time, I've probably changed which stories are my favorite. I think I remember growing up and thinking that the story of Joseph was really a great story, and it is. But <clears throat> Probably after I became a father, I shifted gears. I moved from identifying with a 17-year-old kid to, uh, to a parent. I wasn't as old as he was, but my, my favorite story is found in the first book of the Bible. We're looking at the last book of the Bible, so we're going from the back side to the front side. And uh, this story adds a great deal of texture in my mind for appreciating the language that uh, John uses. Uh, you may remember me mentioning that in the book of Revelation, John uses probably close to 30 different titles to describe Jesus. But the one term that is repeated over and over and over and over again is the word lamb. There are different word combinations, but there must be, if he's using that word so often, there must be a reason behind it. There must be, and I don't pretend to exhaust that, but maybe as we reflect on this message, it will awaken you to things that I haven't thought of, I haven't mentioned, about the lamb, the qualities of the lamb. Why did the lamb get picked out as a symbol of Jesus? But anyway, my favorite story is um, about Abraham who was, had been a father for, well, a father of the promised son for 20 years. And um, he was woken up in the night, and he was told to go and offer his son as a sacrifice. I don't know if he was groggy when he woke up from this um, moment, if he thought he was having a bad dream. Uh, he must have had questions. You know, the Bible story, you know, is told the way the Bible teller or the Bible writer wrote it. <clears throat> but I don't think it's wrong for us to embellish, not to, that we're trying to change the message, but just trying to connect with the story even more, hopefully. So as you think about this message that Abraham received, perhaps... Most of you, maybe your fathers, um, how would you respond to such a question? Um, he must have really struggled with this question. Um, why is God asking me to do this? Um, he gives and then he takes away. I'm sure the enemy was there to drag him through the mud and discourage him. Um, maybe the enemy said, was making accusations against God. Is this the way he treats his followers, um, you know, 
I've never had to deal with this before. Is there somebody who I can talk to about this? Is there somebody who could give me some kind of, be a, a sounding board for me to process this, to really come to terms with this before I take this step? He must have also thought about his wife. I mean, he had two sons, really, when you think about Ishmael. But I'm sure Isaac was special because he was the promised one. But how would Sarah respond? Should, is it fair of him to make a decision without her input? Well, he may have thought about the past and maybe some input that she had on certain decisions that really weren't good. And that's not a, a dismissal of the wife's role. Uh, those of us who are husbands, if we're honest, we have to confess that we have been, our skin has been saved by our wife's counsel, right? I'm not going to ask for any hands, but I found that to be true in my life as well. well. I suspect that Abraham also must have prayed about this. Did I hear you right, God? What is there that you're, you know, have in mind for me? And um, it appears that God was silent. He didn't... Uh, respond to his questions. And as Abraham prayed, I wonder if he didn't um, reflect back on how God had led him in his past. You know, he was called by God out of Ur of the Chaldees to leave that idolatrous area. And he went to Haran, which is west, and maybe a bit north. And eventually he was told to go to uh, Canaan, and given the promise that he would be the father of many nations, as numerous as the stars of heaven. <clears throat> and so he looked back and saw how God had led in the past. And he felt maybe affirmed that why would God lead him in a way that would tear him down or discourage him? Well, Abraham certainly, as he prayed, as he reflected on his past, must have been convicted that he didn't have a perfect record. You know, he had failures. Um, he had to improvise on God's suggestions, modify his leading. Um, and so maybe it helped him realize that he really needed to be more dependent on God and not try to improve on God's revelation of what he wanted him to do. I need to switch screens here. Um, let's see, how come it's not doing what I need it to do? Okay, we'll go with, go with this. <clears throat> well, eventually, the thought did come to him. We don't know when it um, was, came into focus for him, but in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, it says that, and this is from the New Living Translation, if I can put my eyes on it. The message was, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life. And why would he conclude that? Well, he and Sarah were, can I use the word sterile? They weren't capable of having children at that age. That had been demonstrated, and that's why Abraham got into the pickle that he got into, trying to improvise on God's provision. <clears throat> so at some point, that must have given Abraham a great deal of encouragement. As, as, as sad as he was about the process that he was going to be involved in, there was just only one way to relate to it. And that was, God has made this promise. My seed shall be as the sand of the sea, as the stars of heaven. And this is, gonna, this is going to, um, what shall I say, interrupt that process. But God is faithful. He's made a promise, and he'll come through for, for, for Sarah and myself. <clears throat> but the three-day journey must have been a very difficult experience for him as he reflected on what he was to do. Perhaps the most concern he had, you know, he had settled it in his mind because he had, he had waken Isaac up, and it wasn't strange for that to happen, apparently it happened a number of times, so Isaac didn't have to ask the question, why did you wake me up and why are we going here? He knew probably what was going to happen in terms of going to some place 
because there were various places that Abraham had erected an altar and uh, engaged in worship at this, these sites. So that was um, not a surprise for, for Isaac. But as he took this three-day three journey, I imagine you know, things weren't normal for him. He wasn't if lighthearted if that was his propensity. He wasn't joking around with his son. He was quiet. And Abraham, Abraham's son Isaac must have sensed, must have respected that invisible barrier that he wanted to just reflect. But eventually, Isaac asked the question. Uh, after the two of them had come to the mountain that God said he would reveal to them, um, he told the servants that had come with him and had brought this donkey that would bear, had bo borne the firewood, uh, said, wait here and we'll return. Um, so Isaac and his dad started moving up the mountain. But Isaac just felt like he had to ask the question. And I wonder if it was really an inspired question. I'm not doubting it. I'm suggesting that it was an inspired question. He said, uh, here's the fire and here's the wood, but where's the lamb? That's a significant question. In fact, I think that question resonated down time. And as people reviewed the story, they must have thought to themselves, where is the lamb? What does this experience teach us? What was God trying to teach Abraham? Well, Abraham, I don't know if he had anticipated the question. If he hadn't, I think the Lord gave him the answer. And it was a wonderful answer. God will provide the lamb. He didn't want to tell his son. Can you imagine telling your son what was going to happen to him? God will provide this, the lamb. And he must have at that point thought that Isaac was the lamb that he was going to have that was provided. He just didn't want to break the news. Uh, what would I, how would Isaac have responded? Would he have wanted to run away? But they continued their journey. And it was enough to satisfy Isaac at the time. But eventually, Abraham, of course, had to reveal to Isaac, his beloved son, that he was the sacrifice. As I've thought about Abraham and Isaac, Abraham was, what, about 120 years of age at that time. It's old by our standards, but um, maybe it's the 70s for us, <laughs> or eight, early 80s, I don't know how we would compare them. But uh, Isaac was only 20. It almost seems that that is the peak of strength for young men. Certainly if he thought about it, if he was inclined, he could have overcome his father. He said, I'm not having any of this. You've lived your life. I've got my whole future. But there must have been some dialogue of explanation, of justification, of helping Isaac come to terms with this experience. Would he have retold the story of the promise that had been made? and how he and Sarah had bungled up the promise. They had tried to intervene in two ways, making it easier the, the in, the, in, to inherit the promises, and God revealed that wasn't the, the solution. And then they, of course, improvised, and as a result, Ishmael was born, and that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was you, Isaac, and he has a plan for you. He, he brought you into existence, and there was no possible um, human justification or understanding of how that could happen. I'm sure Abraham and, and Sarah had intentionally attempted to make um, good God's promise, but it didn't work. But God had, had a promise, and he had this promise that he was going to give us a son, and uh, Ishmael wasn't the answer, and Eliezer wasn't the answer, Isaac was the answer. And for some reason, God has awakened me. He's given me this clear instruction. I've prayed it through. And uh, you've heard all these stories before, perhaps more stories that are contained 
in the Bible itself um, that Isaac was one who would consent. And, um, and so he, Isaac didn't offer any resistance. In fact, I've wondered to myself if Abraham was tempted to say, look, Lord, I've had a full life. I've been a young man. I've been married. I've had children. Uh, I don't have much longer to live. Oh, he did. He lived for another, what, 50 some odd years. But um, did he think about exchange, making an exchange? Look, why don't you take the knife? I'll be bound up and you can offer me as a sacrifice. I mean, if God is looking for a sacrifice, let's, um, let's use good judgment. You know, I, I, I'm not telling you that that's what he thought, but you know, he had to process this thing and come to terms with it. But eventually he figured out that when he improvised, it was a bad result. When he trusted God, it was a good result. And so he, he endeavored to continue to trust God in this particular situation. And so he bound his son, his 20-year-old son, and he tried to help his dad, who was older, to get him on the altar and um, arrange the wood. And um, eventually it came time to lift the knife. And when he lifted the knife and he was ready to follow through with his decision, after they had, I'm sure, prayed together, he heard the voice. And it said, it was an interruption. It was a, um, God stopped this process and he realized that Abraham was realized. He knew that, of course, that Abraham finally made a complete surrender of himself. And Isaac had done the same. And the sacrifice was interrupted that rang out with authority saying, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. This language, I think, is emblematic of what it's pointing forward to. I wonder if Isaac's question, where is the lamb, was pondered in the minds and hearts of those who are familiar with the story. Did this point forward to something significant that had not yet happened? There must have been people who pondered the question, especially those who lived after the writing of the book of Isaiah, particularly chapter 23, where it speaks about a lamb, prophetic of God's lamb. And of course, John the Baptist eventually came along and I'm sure he must have read these passages, not with complete understanding, we know. But when he saw Jesus coming to be baptized, he said, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. So why do you think that 60 years later, approximately, the Apostle John was inspired to use this thematic language, this Terminology, 27 times in the book of Revelation. This imagery expresses the deepest and richest symbols that have ever been used to describe Jesus. These phrases using the word lamb in my mind emphasize Jesus' function as foundational to describe his mission and the success, the secret of his success. <clears throat> if that is the case, what is there about the bleeding lamb or the lamb that was slain that is the secret of Jesus' effectiveness? What is there about this picture of Jesus that motivates lost people to open their hearts to Christ? Such a costly sacrifice. I mean, this wasn't just some acquaintance of God that was offered. This wasn't an angel that was created. This was his own son. And uh, we know from the book of John, I think it's chapter 8, verse 56 to 58, that when Abraham saw my day, he was glad. 
Abraham, of all people who ever lived before Christ came, I think understood and more than any other what the Father was going to do. It will be an interesting conversation to have with Abraham to find out what thoughts went through his mind as he reflects. He reflected on his experience and then found out what really it was symbolic of. Such a costly sacrifice and such a statement about how cherished fallen human beings are and how willing Jesus was to pay the price of our redemption. If we were to meditate on what it cost Jesus to redeem our lives from the darkness, deception, and bondage of sin, shouldn't our love for Jesus be deeper and have a more powerful influence over our choices and behaviors? You've probably read the passage. It's in the handout that I distributed or that Janelle distributed for me. In there, there's a sentence that you've heard about the 144,000. I'd like to read it for you. It was first spoken back in 1903 on April 12. <clears throat> and it says, Let us strive with all the power that God has given us to be among the 144,000. I've never read the context before in the last couple of weeks. I never knew where it came from. I just heard it. And I don't know if it's, that's your experience or not. <clears throat> but the 144,000 are not described as following Jesus with any of the other terms like the King of Kings or the other titles that you can find in the book of Revelation. In the passage, which is our scripture reading, it mentions the 144,000 following the Lamb. Not following King Jesus, not following the healer, not, no, not following the one who knows the end from the beginning. These are all true. But the imagery that's given to us is that this group of people are following the Lamb. And we're encouraged, aren't we, to, to be among the 144,000. I don't know that that is talking necessarily about you know, being a member of that group, but having the experience that that group is portrayed as having. You probably remember when we reflected on Revelation 5 about the fact that there was no one worthy to open the seven seals. When John found that out, he began to weep, but he was assured by an angel that one had been found to open the seven seals. John had heard that it was the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he had overcome and was able to open the seals. But when John turned around, he didn't see a lion of the tribe of Judah, this majestic, powerful, overwhelming force to be dealt with. He saw just the opposite, a lamb. What a contrast. And he saw the lamb as it had been slain. And because the bleeding lamb had overcome, he had the power and the right to break the seals and reveal the destiny of mankind. When we looked at it back when we talked about Revelation 5, I didn't know, maybe you did, but I didn't I wasn't aware of a literary device that is used on more than one occasion. In fact, it's used on five occasions. And the, the pattern is this. First, the person who is, well, John, who hears something, and he hears, in this case, um, a lion of the tribe of Judah being described. But then when he turns around, he sees something. He sees the lamb. And this pattern is repeated, like I said, five times or four other times in the book of Revelation. And so as we look at this pattern that we have before us about the uh, lion and the lamb, we find it a further explanation of what 
I mean, Jesus is the Lamb of the tribe of Judah, right? He's also the Lamb of God. But what he hears and what he might think he's going to see is different. But it's a further revelation of God's plan of salvation. Well, as I was preparing for this sermon, I came across this literary device. I hadn't known about it before. And it's from a book, uh, it's called The Revelation of Jesus Christ, and it's written by one of our seminary professors. I didn't have him as a teacher. He's probably younger than I am, but he's a teacher at the seminary at Andrews University. And he was illuminating my understanding of this device. His name is Ronko Stevanovich. And he gave us four examples. And so the first example comes from the prologue of the book of Revelation where John hears a loud voice of a trumpet behind him. When he turns around, he sees not a trumpet, but he sees Jesus walking in the midst of the seven candlesticks. The second example is what we already mentioned. The third example is from chapter 17, where John hears of the great prostitute sitting on many waters. What he later sees is a woman sitting on a scarlet beast whose name is Babylon. The fourth example comes from the last vision where John hears the bride, the wife of the lamb. But what he actually sees is the holy city, Jerusalem, in its glory. This literary technique is the clue for understanding these two groups of God's people in chapter 7. And if you have read, we're not going to have you read it. You can read it when you get home. But in Revelation 7, the first eight verses talk about the 144,000. And John hears that. You with me? He hears the voice proclaiming those 144,000. And then it goes on to name the tribes. And he names all the tribes except Dan. Manasseh is the one that's inserted in the place of Dan because Dan had some loyalty issues and he was replaced. <clears throat> but um, you know, then it lists off the, the names of these tribes, uh, 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 from that tribe. And so there's 12, 12 times 12 is 144,000. And I don't know how many of you are inclined or took statistics in college. I did, and I'm fascinated by numbers. But what is the statistic probability of there being exactly 12,000 from each tribe? It's, pardon me? It's not very probable. You use the word impossible. And so what it suggests is that it's symbolic. I, like I said, I'm a numbers person. I took the time to copy and paste the population of the different countries. And they vary from the smallest, which is actually a country, the Vatican. They only have 801 people there, to China, which has 1.4, I forget all the numbers, 1.4 billion people. And so its population groups aren't evenly distributed. There are population groups that are close, but there's some that are way out there, like India and China, and there's others like, not as small as the Vatican, but in the tens of thousands instead of the hundreds of millions like we have in America. So it's, a, it's symbolic. Well, as we zero in and drill down on 144,000, um, it's good for us to reflect back on them that there aren't 12 tribes anymore. As you may remember, in 722, the northern tribe was um, taken into custody, if that's, that's not the right word. They were violently treated, and they were taken, they were deported into various countries which Assyria ruled. So the 10 tribes were disciplined by God for their idolatry, and they were never restored to their own land like Judah was. This was to have been a lesson, of course, for Judah, but Judah didn't learn very well. And so God had to discipline them, just like he disciplined the 10 tribes. And Nebuchadnezzar came along, and he conquered uh, Jerusalem. 
and on three different occasions deported people in 605 BC, 597 BC, and 586 BC. Well, eventually, uh, God restored his people and brought them back. And of course, the tribe of Judah was the tribe through which Jesus came, and that tribe was restored, and uh, Jesus eventually was born. And his genealogy was preserved. We already mentioned that the tribe of Dan is not included. So only 11 of the 12 original tribes were used to symbolize something um, in the book of Revelation. The last thing, and I guess we've mentioned that also, but in addition to that, what we've said is that this is bigger than, than the Jews because Jesus declared that your house is now left unto you desolate and he charged his disciples to preach the gospel into all the world. And in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, we have this verse that says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So there are four other passages also that indicate certain people prior to Revelation were sealed. So just because there's this 144,000 or a special group of people, it doesn't mean that people who have that experience have not had that same kind of experience before. They're just not at the end of time. So the statement, again, that is in your um, hands, uh, I think it's probably the fourth or fifth paragraph. It says, let us strive with all the power that God has given to be among the 144,000. As you start to read that through, you'll notice that the first paragraph is a quotation from Revelation chapter 7, starting in verse 9, I think it is, and going to the end of the chapter. And who does it describe? It's describing the great multitude. So he hears the 144,000, he sees a great multitude. It suggests that the 144,000 is just a representation of what God is going to do in a marvelous way beyond our imagination. It's a great multitude of people who are going to embrace Jesus as their Savior. Oh, I think I went the wrong way. Okay, sorry. In this uh, handout, there's another paragraph that um, is descriptive, and it seems, it seems to me that Ellen White is not trying to differentiate these two as you read through this passage. She's blending them. And here's a statement I thought was really good. It's paragraph three. We are to copy no human being. There is no human being wise enough to be our criterion. We are to look to the man Christ Jesus, who is complete in the perfection of righteousness and holiness. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the pattern man. His experience is the measure of the experience that we are to gain. His character is our model. Let us then take our minds off the perplexities and difficulties of this life, like COVID-19, and fix them on him, that by beholding, we may be changed into his likeness. We may behold Christ to good purpose, we may safely look to him, for he is all wise. As we look to him and think of him, he will be formed within the hope of glory. We can get so sidetracked. You've heard of a red herring? You know, there's no such thing as a fish by the name of red herring. It's, and because of that, when you see a red herring, you look at that, and it distracts you from, which, from fishing. And uh, Satan has... Too many ways of distracting us. Last night after I got my message in the shape I wanted it in and tried to come back to it, I discovered it got deleted. I thought, oh no. And I became panicked. 
And uh, the Lord is gracious and merciful. There was some I had to go back to the day before and had to try to remember what I wanted to say. But we can get so easily distracted. We, get, we forget that God is almighty, all-knowing, completely capable of dealing with a situation we may face. We should naturally turn to him as the flower turns to the sun. Even though it's perplexing, even though it's difficult like Abraham had, uh, we need to make him our first one to consult. Sometimes maybe our spouse shouldn't be part of that decision for whatever reason. Or maybe we shouldn't be part of our spouse's decision. God is capable of accomplishing what he wants. And we can be grateful for that. <clears throat> what encourages me about this literary device is how it demonstrates how successful the giving of the last message of mercy will be. The Lord's mission sounds very much like its result. Here's the mission, Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth. And listen to these next four words that are emphasized, to every nation and tribe and language and people. Now let's look at the great multitude, the results of giving the message. There will be a great multitude that no man can number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne of the Lamb. As great as the trouble that the saved will face, it will not overwhelm their faith in God. Isn't that wonderful? God, Jesus' mission that he gave the church, our church, preach the gospel into every nation, tribe, kindred, tongue, and people. The great multitude, the same result, or the same um, categories or description of those who will be saved. There will be a bountiful harvest that cannot be numbered who follow the lamb wherever he leads. As we close our service together, I invite you to bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your great mercy. And looking through the lens that Abraham had, that perhaps we can identify with in some small way, we know that all of us, we haven't been tested before, we will be tested in the future. Maybe not in the same way Abraham was, but it'll be a test for us. And we pray that we will have learned the lesson well, that you are our sufficiency, you are our wisdom, Jesus is our role model. Together you have demonstrated how deeply and sacrificially you love us. We're so grateful. We're so unworthy. And you're so merciful. We can't express our gratitude as fully as we should, but we look forward to the time when you bring an end to this experiment and restore your people once again to joining with others and we can swell the, the music of heaven. We may not have as good a voice as Gabriel, but our experience is precious. You are precious. And we thank you for the children you've given us who are precious. Through these avenues, help us to appreciate more fully what you've done. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen.